uh, nice to just get tips and ideas to make it easier for you and your kids. So I'd like to present Hildy and she'll tell you a little bit about herself and then play on the workshop. So. Oh, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak in here today. You detect a little accent. I'm from Germany originally. If I start speaking German, please raise your hand. I'm the uh, owner of Life Changing Solutions, and I've been working with parents, individuals, couples, schools, pediatricians, counselors for more than 20 years. And uh, my mission is to reach as many people as possible. Now with Zoom and everything getting better, I can reach them all over the world. I would like to create more peace and harmony in their lives. And um, my expertise and main focus is on obviously parent education, uh, peaceful conflict resolution, effective communication, reduction of stress and anxiety, and overall well-being. And uh, my services uh, include like workshops like this. I also offer four-week parenting seminars and uh, in-home coaching. So I go to families' homes for over 20 years and uh, now Zoom and, and over the phone as well. And I know there's only so much time today and you probably will have a lot of questions and I would love to answer them all, but it's impossible. What I would like to suggest is, you know, if you have any questions beyond this um, little seminar this morning, feel free to contact me per email or per phone. I'd be happy to give you a free consultation. And uh, people always ask me, said, what inclined you to become a family coach? Because I don't even have any children. Uh oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have a background in psychology many, many years ago, and while I was studying, I was going through an intensive growing process within myself, and my heart went out to, I just wanted to help other people and them understanding themselves better, but especially to children. And I started taking care of foster children, and uh, while I had foster children, I dealt with the most challenging one, as you probably can imagine. Mm -hmm. And I realized that even though with my background in psychology, I thought I knew it all. No, nope, didn't know nothing. I understood the behavior, but couldn't redirect it, especially when it comes to how many of you feel like your kids don't want to listen? Sometimes, a lot. And I had that same problem. And somebody told me about a parenting class, and I was the only one sitting in the class that had no children. <laughs> and, and, uh, the philosophy after the first se session already, it just changed my whole view about parenting. And the tools were so um, amazing that I felt in my heart, this is what I want to do with my life. This is what I want to teach. And as I went along and learned more and more and more, I decided to start my own business 20 years ago, become a parent educator. And from there, I build on, I do all kinds of different things now but it's really become a passion. And um, again, you will have probably a lot of questions, and, but I want you to get the most out of this little workshop. I always suggest keep your questions to the end. Of course, if there's something you don't understand, I'm saying please raise your hand, make a little note, and hopefully we'll have a little time afterwards and I can answer some questions. And if your uh, uh, questions are not getting answered, feel free to contact me any time. Um, I don't know if you saw the uh, yellow flyer. I'm also offering four-week online classes. So if you like what you're seeing here today and want to sign up for an online class, please just let me know. You can also see me after this workshop. I'll stay a little longer here if you have any additional <coughs> questions to that. And um, Anyways, uh, but you know, people always ask me during the workshop what they will gain if they actually take the whole class. I just want to give you just a very quick brief overview about what you will gain if you're taking the whole seminar. is uh, reduce arguing, scolding, and yelling. Feel more calm and create more time for yourself. Learn how to handle power struggle, not only in the moment, but also to avoid them in the future. Um, learn the difference between punishment, discipline, and consequences, how to handle sibling and peer rivalry, enhance your child's self-esteem, which we will focus on today, and also learn the difference between encouragement and praise. And that was one of the biggest eye-opener for me when I started parent education, and you will, after this workshop, you will know why, because there's so many messages they sound kind, they sound, you know, make sense, but they can be very disheartening to our children 
and they create this little story. They we feel like it is encouraging, but they don't. They see it actually as discouraging. So I share all those things with you today, so we can effectively encourage your children, and not only encourage them, but also teach them to encourage themselves, because that's the ultimate outcome we want. You know, want them to learn that. And also how to uh, talk so children will listen and listen so children will talk. And the most important thing what you will learn in the four-week seminar is just also how to take care of yourself. And uh, what the kids will learn is responsibility and in initiative, self-control, how to encourage themselves, resistance to peer pressure, cooperation skills, conflict resolution skills, and communicate openly with dignity and respect. How many of you feel sometimes that your children don't really open up a lot and or are not respectful? We all have been there, right? We know how the situation goes. Before I address the, today's topic about how to enhance your child's self-esteem, I would like to establish a basic understanding of all children, all people really, and what motivates their behavior. Do you ever wonder why children misbehave and then they keep doing it and again and again and again? Well, one thing I got out of my first parenting class when I took it over 20 years ago is like, all behavior has a purpose and all misbehavior is communication. And what children, not only children, adults do, this all applies not only to children but also to us. So you will see something, learn something about yourself. Every time your children are misbehaving, or in general behavior is, we're trying to communicate something. So when your children are misbehaving, I want to challenge you today and do a little paradigm shift from how you have been seeing your children before you came in today and how you're hopefully going to see them after you leave this workshop today. You know, we often feel exhausted and I understand and frustrated, but when your children are misbehaving, just understanding that they're trying to communicate a basic need, I think was at least for me very helpful. I didn't take it so personally. But children, certain ages, they don't, they don't know. They don't know what their basic need is. They don't come to you and say, hey, mom, I want some power and control, right? Or dad, I don't feel hurt and understood. A five-year-old, six-year-old, seven, or even seven, they don't do this. They don't understand unless we teach them, right? So we need to understand that every behavior has a purpose and what they're trying to communicate are basic needs. So basically, misbehaving children are discouraged children. So this is where, you know, the self-esteem starts. If the children are discouraged, obviously it's not really good for their self-esteem. So that's number one, we need to understand what they're trying to communicate. I, I have some handouts for you. If you could look at the handout, Understanding Behavior and Changing Our Beliefs. I'd like to go through this with you quickly, just to understand. Do you feel like we sometimes use the same discipline methods over and over again? And we don't even realize this and we wonder why they're not effective. So this is why it's so important to understand children's behavior. The reason why it often doesn't work or it's not effective anymore, maybe it was effective a while ago, but then all of a sudden like, oh, this is not working anymore. We need to find out what the ch child is communicating. What are they communicating? What basic need is this? I'm gonna give you a couple quick examples. For example, attention. You know, you all agree probably attention is a basic need, right? Mm -hmm. If we don't get attention even as adults, we're not very happy, right? We get frustrated. So we may not communicate it directly, but indirectly with frustration. So we adults misbehave too, right? Because nobody has taught us to commute, at least not me, and I think most people, our parents didn't say like, hey, you know, I want to make sure your basic needs are met, right? So, but we misbehave, and if we misbehave, or the children misbehave, often we as adults react to it, right? When we react to something interesting, children get programmed. They don't quite understand what's going on. If a two-year-old, and if you react to them, they could make up all kinds of different stories. 
But one of them they, they definitely make up is, oh, I get attention by being bad. I get a reaction out of my parents, but I get attention. Bad attention is better than no attention. Do you see how we get conditioned? And interesting enough, the same is with power. Power and control, I've been doing this for over 20 years. There's maybe two parents in 20 years came up with the idea that actually the basic need for power and control, that that actually exists. It's a basic need, like as important as food, shelter, attention, love, etc. So if there's basic need for power and control is not met, guess what they do? They defy you. And when they defy you and they get a reaction out of you, here's something really interesting that changed my thinking about parenting is they learn, oh, if I get another, if I get a reaction out of the adult, whoever it is, especially the parents, it makes me feel empowered and valuable. So I will be out of control sometimes. They don't like it when you yell at them and you're reactive or repeat yourself, but they do love that feeling of being in control and powerful. And they learn, so I will be out of control sometimes because it fulfills my basic need. Obviously, they're not conscious in that moment about what's really happening, but guess what? We take this into adulthood. We learn already as a two-year-old, if I get other people upset, it makes me feel empowered. And we learn to identify ourselves with that belief, take it into adulthood. How many of you feel like sometimes you're arguing all the time? With your kids or even with other people, family, friends, your partner. And I used to be the master of arguments. I grew up with, in the family, <laughs> my, my parents were arguing day in and day out. It was just, I thought that was normal. And guess what I did when I grew up? Argued all the time. But here's the interesting part. When we argue, 99% it's not about the issue, it's about power. It's about wanting to win. There's two people not willing to give up their position, right? Otherwise we wouldn't argue. So if we keep fighting and fighting and fighting, it's not about the issue. How many of you feel sometimes you get into an argument and then five minutes or ten minutes later, it's not even about the topic anymore? Been <laughs> <laughs> there, done that. So it's about power. We're actually fulfilling our basic need for power and control in an inappropriate way. Can you see that? Is that amazing? And most parents don't know every time we react and repeat, 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 we're feeding into it and the power struggles actually get worse. There's no reason to argue. If, you know, we're not going to, I'm not going to go in detail about power struggle because this workshop is about self-esteem. But also, what does power, when the power struggle, if we keep arguing, what happens to the child's self-esteem? It goes down, right? Nobody likes to be yelled at. Is there anybody in here? Like <laughs> I know. <laughs> People, you know, for me, somebody just has to slightly raise their voice and it reminds me, unfortunately, of something gets triggered inside of me because there was a lot of yelling where I grew up. So it's not so much even the yelling, it's also the tone of voice. So remember, if the kids get a reaction out of you, you're feeding into the getting a basic need met for power and control in an inappropriate way. And if we don't relearn that, if we don't reprogram that, that's what they're going to do. They do exactly what you're doing today. Okay. So I just want you to understand, so basic needs, when the children defy you, they are communicating, my basic need for power and control is not met, therefore, I'm not happy. I'm discouraged, again, coming back to, you know, lowers their self-esteem. And they will keep misbehaving and testing you and on and on and on. Um, so let's take a look at the old beliefs on your flyer. It says, they only want attention, they're stubborn, they're spoiled, they're selfish and self-centered, they're inconsiderate, they're just like their mother, father. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> They can't help it, they have bad genes, my spouse and I are bad parents. Conclusion, misbehaving child equals bad child equals bad parent. I must control, so the reaction is usually I must control or manipulate my child's behavior or I'm a bad parent. Sounds familiar? So let's do the paradigm shift here now. 
go to the new beliefs. Children misbehave because their needs are not being met. Mm -hmm. And look at those basic needs. Some of them are already mentioned. We want to feel that we belong, to be loved, to be powerful, to be valuable, to feel like they have a place, to experiment and explore, to be heard, to be understood. This is kind of like a major basic need. There's a big lack of it almost in every relationship. And I'm going to talk a little more. Actually, I brought you um, another handout. And I want you to, we're going to go briefly through it today about the power of listening. I wrote this article and sent it out the other day. And listening, which means feeling heard and understood. Most people don't even know that the basic need as well. And listening, I'm not talking about listening to the words. It's listening to their feelings and validating those feelings, no matter how irrational. If your kid's feelings don't get validated, even if you disagree, that's often why they don't want to come to you and speak with you. I remember I never felt heard and understood by my parents. They never knew anything at all about my life. Number one, I was scared I'd get punished if I would open up. The other one, which I learned later in life, or didn't even occur to me, was I didn't feel hurt and understood. Why would I want to open up to somebody if I don't feel hurt and understood? Listening is not so much about hearing the words. It's about acknowledging the feelings. It's about feelings. And even if it's complete, if you completely disagree, we can still make the other person feel hurt and understood. And you don't even have to say, I understand. You can say, I hear you. I see your point. There's different ways to go, because this was probably one of the hardest things for me. And I said, like, you know, I agree with you. No, I don't, because I used to be very, very strong. I mean, I'm still strong-willed, but I used to argue all the time. And I had to prove my point, because that was model to me. And um, so please validate your kids, no matter what. Listen first, then maybe suggest some solutions. But if you do it during, while well, listening, if you suggest solutions, it's not really listening. Or you say, like, why do you feel this way? It's not listening, it's trampling on their feelings. Okay, so please listen first. Make them feel heard and understood. And that's also, please use this in your adult life with your partner, because these are tools I'm teaching for your kids, but please use them because I do couples uh, counseling as well. It's the number one reason why they seek me out. There's also the number 95% of young adults, misbehaving young adults, the number one wish they had, guess what that was? the parents would listen better to them. Also, all the suicidal teenagers, number one request, guess what that is? My parents don't listen to me, they want their parents to listen to them. Okay, so listening is very, very, very important. And again, if we feel listened to, do we feel encouraged? Of course. If we don't feel listened to, we might feel like we're not important, right? So again, what does it do to their self-esteem? Goes down. So this all like connects to a good self-esteem. So listening, fulfilling the basic needs, and on and on and on. And please remember all misbehavior is communication. And what they're trying to communicate are basic needs. When your children are misbehaving, just think like, okay, this is my a discouraged child trying to communicate a basic need, but they don't know how unless we teach them. A nice way to teach them is to disclose what you think they're trying to communicate. Let's say they're misbehaving to get your attention. And some of you may do this already. If you could acknowledge them in the voice, I understand you want my attention. Not only do you make them feel hurt and understood, but also disclose the goal. And they learn like, oh, that's what I'm seeking here right now, is attention. So you're teaching them also the right wording. 
to ask appropriately for attention. If you don't have time in that moment, the acknowledgement, just a few seconds, will make a huge difference. Take a few seconds, but set a time. And don't say just later, because later often doesn't come, right? Set a time, I'll be with you in 10 minutes or five minutes, whatever it is, but acknowledge and you will notice a huge difference in your child's behavior if you do that. Did you know also that experts say uh, to fulfill the basic need for attention is a minimum of 12 to 15 minutes a day? That's the good news. <laughs> I read a book about 20 years ago about, it's written by Dorothy Briggs called Your Child's Self-Esteem, and she's, there was one sentence that always sticks with me. She said, you can spend all day with your children unless you spend 100% attention, one-on-one. -on -one. I'm talking about 100%, put everything aside. Be in the child's world. Look at them. Be on their level. Be 100% there. It's like no attention at all. Ever heard about this? It's like no attention at all, unless it's 100%. And when I'm talking about to feel, fulfill that basic need for attention, that is what we're talking about, that one of the basic needs. If that need is not met, I promise you, they will get it met. I was talking, I did a phone session yesterday with a new client, and when we were talking, one of the things I focus first on is, are those basic needs are met? And most people don't know that, oh, I spend all day with them. We're doing this and this and this and this, but there's other people around, right? Mm -hmm. Or a second child. <clears throat> she has actually four children. I said, oh my God, this is so hard for me, even though she doesn't work, but still, and she has two-year-old twins. How am I gonna, so we figured out a plan how she can do that. Like I said, the good news is it doesn't take all day long, okay? But remember, it has to be 100%. Just by using that tool and, and think about what it does to their self-esteem. You can even in less than a minute, just what I said earlier, if you don't have the time in the moment to give them a few minutes, acknowledge them. I understand you want my attention. Can you give me five, 10 minutes? Set the timer so you won't forget because if you forget, they lose trust. Make sure you follow up with it, because how many of you feel like I'm later, 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 never comes? And the same is in adult relationships as well, right? We do this with our partners, with our friends, and then they get frustrated because their basic needs are not met. Make sure with all your loved ones that those basic needs are met, okay? Otherwise, I promise you they will get it met, usually in an inappropriate by misbehaving or indirectly, we always communicate our basic needs. So, and teach your child to learn. That's what they need. Teach them also to communicate this. So can you imagine you're teaching your kids all those things and they grow up and they have these beautiful relationships, they're actually communicating it in an appropriate way instead of, you know, by yelling or frustrated and with only strains the relationships. There's also, when, when I mentioned earlier, our reaction to the child's behavior will influence their personality now into adulthood. Can you see that? Little things, just a little quick reaction. They not only learn like, oh, reacting is part of communication. I used to be a master of reacting. And because I learned it from my parents. I thought that's a way of communicating. There's different ways. Some people actually think you're born reactive. Mm -mm. We may be born strong-willed or more open, but the reaction is a learned behavior. We can learn to respond instead of reacting. Um, the next flyer I want you to look at is, um, give me a sec here, is five ways we discourage children. But you know what, before I even go into that, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we can encourage children and encourage ourselves at the same time. <clears throat> 
<coughs> no, unfortunately, we live in a negative environment. People rather focus on the negatives than the positives. Would you agree with that? Bad news and this and this and and when we tap and which creates obviously negative thoughts, right? You know what Ellen, Eleanor Roosevelt said, it's one opinion of oneself. If we have negative thoughts, do you feel more discouraged or encouraged? Discouraged, obviously. Did you know that actually 95% of our thoughts create emotions? Emotions create behavior, correct? If we're negative, it creates a negative emotion. And the negative emotion, if we are discouraged, we're more irritable, frustrated, moody, and everyone around you feels that. But especially your children, because they don't understand what's going on. Right? Guess what they're learning? Being negative, right? So we passing on our anxieties, our negativity to our children, what do you think happens? They keep doing it, take it into adulthood, and they're doing exactly the same we are doing. We definitely want to avoid that. You can teach them now to have a more positive self-talk. How do we do this? We have, to we have to start with ourselves, right? Check in with your thoughts. Have communication with your children about. Do exercises about like, hey, you know, how do we feel when we're happy? And how do we feel when we have negative thoughts? So we're learning how it actually affects us. Make sure your child's self-talk is positive. You might want to do even like, you know, do exercise. There's actually a couple exercises, really cute. We call them one is encouragement feast. And what that means, you may want to write this down. It's, it's a very simple, fun, but yet very, very powerful exercise. And you can do it at the dinner table. You can do it in the car. You can do it anywhere, really, is we tell each other what we like about each other. But when we tell each other what we like about each other, we want to make sure it's not praise, but encouragement. And I'll tell you later the difference about it. So encouragement, a simple encouragement could be describe the good behavior. Describe, for example, instead of saying, oh, you're such a good girl. What does that really mean? Am I usually not a good girl? That's what they might think. So we have to be very careful, and it's, a, it's used a lot. I see this all the time, or hear this all the time. Believe me, I didn't know about all of this before I started all this. I was completely lost, even with my background in psychology. So make sure, ask them questions. So a simple question could be maybe at the end of the day you ask them, what was the best thing that happened to you today? And then ask them what was the worst. So find out, hopefully they, they share more positive things than negative things. But if it's negative, help them to redirect that. Make them understand how it affects them. Maybe do some exercise together with them. Share the encouragement feast is something, you know, maybe make it a habit at the dinner table or on the weekend. I would like for you to give each other encouragements every day, at least once. How many of you, we do this more with kids. How about adults, partners? How many times do you tell each other what you like about each other? When I counsel couples, <laughs> when I counsel couples, I get the same reaction. Like, Look at each other, they can't even remember. Isn't that sad? It is so sad. It almost makes me cry. And I was the same way because it wasn't modeled by my parents. So sad. And then they wonder why they end up in, in couples counseling. There's no listening, there's no encouragement, they don't feel appreciated. There's, but there's such simple things. How long does it take to give somebody an encouragement? A few seconds. I said, if you don't see each other, you know, text your partner. Write your kid, whatever it takes. So make sure we encourage each other. 
but the encouragement is specific, like for example, thank you for helping me set the table, instead of saying, you're such a good boy. Okay, be specific, non-manipulative, internally motivating. See, that's the difference between praise and encouragement. You're such a good boy, oh, you're the best. That's, can you see like the <coughs> external motivation here? What does it really mean? But if you describe it, it allows them to look inside because that's what we call internal motivation. Do you see the difference? Okay. Or you can even ask them, is it how does it make you feel when you're kind to your sister? When we encourage, what we often do is, I'm going to give you an example. Let's say your child brings home an A on the report card. And she's like, oh my God, you're the best. You're so awesome. You're the best in the whole entire class. I am so proud of you. Sounds familiar? <laughs> Almost our whole society does that. However, let's take a closer look at this. When I give my child those messages, number one, when they keep hearing, you're the best, guess what happens? They feel like they have to perform the best, not trying your best, the best. Can you see how much pressure it puts on them? Otherwise, they may not feel loved. It's conditional. The other one is, what I hear a lot, and I don't want to take this away from the parents. We all love to tell our children we are proud of them. But I want to show you something. If we use this only, keep saying this, guess what the child is learning? I have to make somebody else proud. I have to make my parents proud. There's also nothing wrong with it, but don't you think it's more important that they feel proud of themselves to keep, motivate, keep motivating themselves? Absolutely. Can you see how the external, I'm so proud of you, are ah, you the best? And by the way, who's doing all the talking? The parent. Where's the motivation coming from? The parent. If the motivation keeps coming from the outside, what is the child learning? I'm going to depend on external motivation. So in order for your child to motivate themselves, mm -hmm. can you see we need to learn how to effectively encourage them and then also teach them how to encourage themselves. So use phrases like instead of the example I gave you earlier, I said, you know, let's say your child comes home with an A on the report card or paints a beautiful picture. I said, ask them. I said, how did you do that? Mm. Or it looks like you put a lot of effort into studying for this particular subject. Or you can also describe what you see if you feel like they, they seem proud or excited put their feelings in the words. Like, oh, you look very proud of yourself. How did you do? Put it on them. Can you see the difference between external and internal motivation? But we're not used to this because we all are dependent on outside motivation. You know, even us as adults, and you may relate to this, and I'm one of them, I always want to get you know, praise from the outside, make me feel good until I learned, like, wait a minute, I need to learn to make myself happy. So make sure, give the children the tools, they look inside and make themselves happy, and it starts with positive talk, self-talk. Okay? So it's very, very important. I'll give you another example how to motivate children, not with external motivation to get a better grade. I'll give you another example. Let's say your child comes home with a D on the report card. What we usually do, I'm not saying all of you doing this, is, I can't believe you got a D. What are you thinking? <laughs> you need to study harder. <laughs> <laughs> Again, who's doing all the talking here? You need to study harder. Who's giving the solutions? The parent. What's the child learning? Oh, somebody else will solve my problem. And are you encouraged if somebody says, what are you thinking? You gotta study harder. Do you really wanna study harder? 
or you only do it because you might get into trouble. <clears throat> so how can we do this different? <laughs> And that's how I was raised. <laughs> I don't know about you, but oh my goodness, you're on the report card. Um, so what you, let's say your child comes home with a D on the report card. They're already discouraged. We don't have to add any <coughs> discouragement, right? Put their feelings into words. You can say something, validate them. It seems like you're a little discouraged about, or you look discouraged. So first validate. Stay kind, don't react. Otherwise, your reaction they might like, oh, I'm gonna get my parents upset, so I'm gonna have, keep having bad grades. <laughs> Com uh, a ho homework or schoolwork is a lot about communication, basic needs. So watch out, no reacting anymore. Stay kind. So the next question, once you validate, put their feelings into words, you can ask questions like, what would you like it to be after you validate? And then they'll give you an answer, hey, at least a B. And then instead, we usually we tell them, do this, do this, do this, do this. No, no. Say, how, what are your plan to bring up that grade if you would like a B? Keep asking them. Another thing what a lot of parents are not aware of is we doing way too much for our children. And they actually feel like they're not capable. That's what they're feeling deep inside, not aware of it. Not only tears, that tears on their self-esteem, they also feel like, oh, somebody else will solve my problem, so I don't have to do anything. When you look at our society, how many People think sometimes, you know, those kids these days are not responsible, they're not motivated, and on and on and on. That's one of the big reasons why. Because we're doing too much. I understand you, the parent, we want to do the best we can. But we want to make sure, we also call this conscious parenting, what I would like for you, what helped me a lot 20 years ago when I was taking care of foster children and studied this, before I said something, I stopped myself. <clears throat> if I had the time, sometimes you can't do this. I said, what is my child learning here right now by my response? And the next question was, how do I want this child as an adult? Because what they learn in the moment, they learn to identify themselves. If it's good or bad, it doesn't matter. They learn to identify themselves with that programming take it into adulthood, and guess what? You're doing the same thing with their children or in their relationships. Call this conscious parenting. Be more aware. We want to become more aware. How, how are our thoughts? What am I really saying? What am I really teaching my child in this moment? You know, you may think right now, oh my God, it's just I don't have the time to do all this. But there's the other part. A lot of parents don't realize how much time we're wasting and correcting and solving problems, which leads to a big overwhelm, especially when they get older. Any expert would tell you that actually five minutes prevention saves you 15 minutes of turmoil. Add this up over the years, so it actually, once you discuss it and you know take care of it, it will save you so much time. Not only time, sanity. <laughs> you know, you more relaxed parent as well. So start using those tools. And um, I wanna want you to go to the handout now, five ways we discourage children. It's gonna fly over this, um, just for you to become aware of. I don't want to discourage you, but I want you to be aware of, okay? Uh, number one is with negative motivation, making children feel bad about themselves, instilling guilt, punishment. Punishment, by the way, is another external motivation. Did you know that? Because when we punish, you go to your room until I tell you to come out again. Who's in control? The parent. Kids learn, oh, somebody else again will take care of my problems. I don't have to do anything. 
And on top of it, it also makes them only more angry. We, um, in our class, when you decide to take the, the, the online seminar, you learn, we call them actually, instead of using punishment, I'll teach you how to use logical consequences. Because punishment only creates more anger, more resentment, and it does not teach the child to take responsibility for their own behavior because we are in control. Okay. Logical consequences are related to the crime. For example, um, if your child, let's say, they, they eat something in the living room and, and they make all this mess, right? And then you um, said, said well, it's not okay to make a mess, right? And we yell at them, said, I can't believe you're making the mess again, and threaten, and often what we also do is we keep giving in, we tell them, you're not, you're not, you can't eat in the living room anymore, you're making a mess, right? And, and again, when you react, you're feeding into it, the child only wants to do it more, right? So we can actually turn every threat into a promise and use a logical consequence. For example, it could look like, you know, you, you, number one, you sit down with your child and discuss it, talk about this. Not, how many of you find yourself, we react, we usually try to solve a problem when we already reacted. It always goes downhill. Never resolves anything because you probably know the next day you're gonna fight about the same problem again, right? So take this situation and say like, I said, look, I need your help on something here. The communication is so crucial, but again, I can't teach you everything tonight. Just give you one example. I said, you know, I need your help, but if they're not willing to come up with a good solution for that, I said, from now on, here is my boundary. When I see you, you know, you can eat in the living room if you clean up after yourself, or don't make a mess. If you decide to make a mess, there's no more, I won't allow you to eat in the living room. You have to go to the kitchen table. Just an example, okay? And then, but then when you say that, now it's all done, it's a related, right? Logical consequence, related, reasonable. And now you give the child the responsibility because you discussed it ahead of time. Here's your choice. Instead of, if you don't do, can you see there's a huge difference? You can eat in the living room, if you decide to clean up after yourself. But then you have to, you know, when you set that boundary, you have to follow through. But no repeating. I would just, let's say the child tests you the next day, I would just walk over there and say, do you remember your choices? In a kind way. If they say no, you repeat it, I said, look, if you clean up your mess, you can stay. Let's say they already made a mess. And or you have to, you can go into the kitchen. If they're resistant, I would just reach out gently, take the plate away, so you can try again tomorrow. End of story. What we do, we get often into an argument after that, right? Again, that feeds into the power struggles. But again, I would um, don't want to talk too much about this. If you want more examples, you can always call me later and learn more about it. Um, doing too much, I just explained how we do way too much. So there's a guilt, a punishment, shame, name calling. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Just even in an innocent comment I hear all the time is, oh, she's shy, or he's shy. If they keep hearing this, guess what they're learning? Shy. Exactly doing too much, making decisions for them, demanding too much for them, expecting too high achievement, um, you know, wanting to be the best instead of saying like, did you try your best? It's a big difference. Giving too much responsibility and not allowing them to be children, discounting or not valuing them, not having time for them, making other things consistently more important, not asking their opinion, not valuing their contribution to the family, denying, denying or minimizing their feelings and wants, not truly listening. Remember when I was talking about the listening part? There is a flyer, a handout, so read through it later. Um, and then also, you know, not empowering them. 
Remember, these are all basic needs. Then there's the permissive part. Not setting or following through with limits, allowing them too much TV or screen time, giving in to their demands, letting them treat you or property disrespectfully. Did you know that any experts will tell you that the permissive approach is actually worse than the autocratic? And the reason why, what a lot of parents don't know is, when we don't set boundaries, kids do need boundaries. But we have to follow, it's easy to set a boundary, but following through, it's the tricky part, right? Because we're afraid of conflict, we're afraid of re rejection. But remember, it's kids do need boundaries. If you don't set boundaries, guess what they're thinking? You might not care enough about them, or you don't love them enough. Even though it looks different, because when we give in, the child looks happy, right? But it really has the opposite effect. And then it creates, like, what's in it for me? So these entitled children, and I see this a lot with teenagers, when we start setting boundaries, ooh, ooh, put your seatbelts off. They get angry. They, they say something like, well, you don't love me anymore. Why should I do this? Because we've been giving in in the past. It's kind of scary. You know, so start early. You gotta set boundaries. Obviously, we want to balance this. That's one thing I'm, I teach during the four-week online seminar: how to set the boundaries in a kind way, mm -hmm. and also follow through in a kind way. Most of us don't have that skill called like peaceful conflict resolution. Everything can be done peacefully. Once you decide to take the four-week class, you don't have to yell anymore. You don't have to repeat yourself anymore. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Everything is set up smoothly. And guess what it does to their self-esteem? And what we're teaching them? This, because you want them to grow up with those skills too, peaceful conflict resolution. When it comes to conflict, there's usually, and, and, and I'm guilty of that too, most of my life there was either fight or flight. Because we didn't know, either we avoided the problem, which only makes it actually worse in the long term, you build resentment, right, and then you explode. Or you keep fighting about the same issue. And I remember my parents, after 20 years, they were still fighting about the same thing. <laughs> Talking about the definition of insanity, right? I've been there, done that. I don't argue anymore. And I used to be the master for more than half of my life. I didn't know any better. Scared a lot of people away. <laughs> Especially with my, my German background. He's so stubborn. <laughs> so I'm strong-willed. <laughs> and German, he's like, oh, go run, Hilda's coming. <laughs> Not anymore, I learned, but the hard way. You don't want to, your children to learn it the hard way. Start now. So there's so many other ways to encourage our children. There's also another um, handout, the problems with praise, or the perils of praise. It gives you some examples. I'd actually like to read this with you. It says, praise the feel-good strategy of choice. And we wonder sometimes, it's not good for our children? Now you know why. Okay. So the encouragement versus praise. Although there are times when praise can be encouraging, teachers and parents will be most effective if they avoid praising children too often. Encouragement helps our children to believe in themselves. This is the known as internal gratification. Praise such as good, great, better, best, excellent, and I'm proud of you, conditions children to look for external gratification. Praise keeps the child dependent on the authority figure to feel good about themselves. On the other hand, encouragement allows your child to, uh, encouragement, hold on. Encouragement allows a child to focus on how she feels from the inside out. For example, phrases like, it looks like you enjoyed drawing that picture, rather than, you are a good boy. Give the child responsibility for his happiness, rather than looking for someone or something to bring him happiness. Children realize that it is their challenge to do things to make themselves happy. 
Praise can be a disguise for expressing our personal values and opinions. Praise focuses on the person, where encouragement focuses on the effort. Through encouragement, we are teaching children to look inside themselves for their motivation, for the answers to their questions, and for knowing their purpose and direction. The remedy to the problem of praise is encouragement. Encouragement can be given at any time, to anyone, in any situation. It focuses on effort, improvement, or choice, and it helps to promote self-esteem and a sense of well-being, confidence, insight, and resilience. And here are some examples of phrases that express encouragement. You seem to like that. You really worked hard on that. Or I need your help on. You can do it. Thank you, that helped me a lot and ask questions like, how do you feel about it? What do you think you are getting better at? And then also remember, encourage them to solve their own problems, depending on their age, obviously. Always offer help, but encourage them first to find solutions. What would you do different next time? First, how you feel about this? What would you want? How can you do this? Okay. Encouragement, encouragement, encouragement. And be specific. One of the easiest one to remember is saying like, thank you. Thank you for setting the table. Thank you for being kind to your sister. Thank you for on and on and on. Let's be specific. And non-manipulative. Encouragement is also about being honest, specific, non-manipulative, and internally motivating. It says, um, the last paragraph, ask open-ended questions, questions that have no single simple answer. Encourage children to think, explain, and explore. Try to redirect the child's thinking process when you hear statements like, I don't care, and it doesn't matter to me. Encourage children to have their own thoughts and opinions. Ask, what do you think? What can you do different next time? Accept children's feelings of failure and encourage more attempts. Good results come from experience. Experience come from bad results. Help children see alternative and challenging situations. For example, I know algebra seems hard to master. Let's see if there's anything we could do to make it easier to understand. Explore ideas together and giving the child the lead. Any questions to that? Yes. Um, this is related to encouragement um, and maybe a nature versus nurture sort of a question. Um, so can do you, in your experience, like can optimism be learned if you already have certain tendencies to see things negatively or black and white or you're in a situation, you or your child, where you fail and you're like, okay, I'm never going to get this, mm -hmm. you know. Um, have you successfully seen that optimism or a more oh, totally. balanced view can be learned? Absolutely. Okay. Number one, always think like, what am I modeling as a parent? Mm -hmm. If you model that behavior, mm -hmm. Actually, the modeling, did you know, Albert Schweitzer said, it's not so much about saying something, it's about 95% children learn from you, not by what you say, but by what you model. Help them together. You can even say like, hey, I noticed as a parent, you know, I've been like negative thinking, you explain to them how it affected you. Then they understand. And then sit down with them and, and redirect it when they make those comments. Another good question to ask them is that say, oh, I'm stupid, I can't do this. And, and you know, you hear those messages sometimes. Sit down, maybe not in that moment. Timing is always crucial, okay? Because we often want to try to solve something when one or the other person is already upset and it's not really effective. Save the time and energy about any problem, unless you have to solve it in that moment, if it's an emergency. Make sure you have good timing. So let's say you sit down with your child when, when the timing is good, and say like, I noticed, okay? 
and then ask them, I said, what do you think happens if you keep telling yourself, I can't do this? So explore, let them think first, but if they don't quite get it yet, then you maybe give them an example how it affects the view, and even if you make something up, okay? And then practice, make a goal of, you know, check in with our thoughts. I see this all the time because I help people also to resolve anxiety, stress, traumas, and everything. These thoughts, you know, we need to practice. It's, it's, we have to reprogram our brain. That's the good news. It's actually scientifically proven. Neuroplasticity. We can change our brain. Isn't that great? A lot of people feel like, oh, I, I'm this way. But if they're deeper traumas, yes, then there's some amazing techniques. Actually, I studied a program, which is the, probably the most incredible thing I ever discovered in my life. About 12 years ago, I learned about this program. I studied the core dynamics of human conditioning and became a master coach, not only identifying what keeps us stuck in life, call them barriers or conditionings. Did you say, think, did you know that like 90% of what we see is not really what it really is, but how we have been conditioned to see it, 90%. So we're going through life, really, with all those conditionings. No wonder we all have those problems, right? So what I started is finding out, you know, in a conflict, there's always underlying fears. And when I find that fear, asking my mind questions, they're usually based all traumas, anxieties, all fear-based. Once I find that particular fear, it can be resolved within minutes. It's unbelievable, the most amazing thing I ever discovered. If anybody wants to learn more about it, if, if, if you feel like you have like anxieties coming up all the time, or something gets triggered all the time, really severely, I can help you to resolve, not, not just manage, resolve. It's almost like my clients call it miracles in minutes. I personally resolved a bunch of traumas on my past with that, otherwise I wouldn't have started the program. I'm German, I need to prove, right? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's very unique. You can also find more information about it. Either you can call me or go on my website. There's like a page just explaining. Because how many of people of you, how many of you feel like we're standing in our own way? We're just in certain areas, we're not moving forward. And especially when it comes to parenting, what I see a lot often without hesitating to set boundaries. There's underlying fears when you take a look at this. Fear of conflict, fear of maybe feeling guilty, fear of rejection. All those fears keep us from setting boundaries, which is so crucial, right? But then also following through, again, the reason why we're not following through is also, again, there's fear, underlying fears, and they can be resolved. They're traumas from the past. They can be resolved within minutes. And I have parents all the time come in to have those fears, and then after we do the technique, they're free to set boundaries and follow through with them without a reaction. It's, it's really amazing. So remember, the kids get conditioned at a very young age. And unless we reprogram that, they take those programs into their adult life. So model, 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 have a talk with them, and practice what I also often do is just tell my, if it's, if it's children and if the parents, you know, if they're smaller children, they need your help. The adults sometimes set your timer every hour in the beginning and check in with your thoughts. Ask, pause, because when we when we thinking or reacting, we're not in the present moment. It's our conditioned mind. Check in. You can ask yourself: Are my thoughts useful right now, or are they not useful? Sometimes they can be useful if there's something I can do about. But if there's nothing I can do about, if there's something from the past that keeps coming up, it's just ruminating, right? And we're going down that rabbit hole. Switch, pause, and say, like, it's going to be OK. Or you're worried about something with your kids. Is it useful? Can I do something about it? Then do something.
But if you can't, often most anxiety is about is projecting a negative outcome. So that, it's a story, but it feels so real in that moment because we have been identifying ourselves with this story for so many years. It almost feels like it's part of you. Do you feel this sometime? We have this worry. But we don't know if, if this is actually going to happen. That can be resolved. It's, it's remaining energy from the past. We have been suppressing, suppressing. And that can be resolved. Beautiful. Love it. <laughs> I know it's actually one of the biggest fears, you know, is to feel. And my instructor always said, like, it was 12, 13 years ago, I said, enjoy feeling it only by really feeling it, you can resolve it. You know, when people go to therapy and they're all talking about you gotta feel, but here is the difference between what I studied and a therapist. They don't have those techniques to actually complete that feeling. They don't do this with you. If they would do that, they would all go out of business. If that could be resolved within a few minutes, traumas. I'm not saying therapists are not good. There's some good therapists out there. They give you solutions. But how many of you feel sometimes you're talking about the same fears and anxiety for years? That can be resolved very, very quickly. Anyways, um, any other, did it kind of answer your question? Any other questions? How about, like, what would be language when the child comes forward and says, like, do you like, like, do you like my drawing? Do you like what I did here? Like, what would be an example of how you redirect? Because they're already coming to you clearly looking yes. for the external validation. Yes. So how do you redirect? Very good question. Them? Very good question. There's different ways. First, you can argue and maybe put the question on to them. How does it make you feel? If they still don't answer because they might not be used to it, I said, you know, you can point out something, but it has to be honest. Looks like, let's say, she uses a lot of red or pink color. I said, looks like pink is your favorite color. Mm -hmm. And then kind of get like a feedback. I said, is that your favorite color? Mm -hmm. And then if you f see a smile on her face, she's excited. You put it on her, say, you look very excited when you draw. Do you enjoy drawing? Or looks mm -hmm. like you enjoy drawing. Because a lot of the teachers, the kids will come up and say, do you like this? And the teachers pretty much all say, well, what do you think? Do you like it? Mm -hmm. That's what's more important. It's like, it doesn't right. matter what I think. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Mm -hmm. How proud are you? And if they say they like it, it's like, great. Wonderful. They mm -hmm. found it. That's, yeah. that's the only thing that really matters. Exactly. And it's also, one more, hold on one second. I just want to forget this <laughs> Focus on the effort. Not the outcome. I almost forgot to say this is huge. Because in our society there is so much competition, you know, kids always feel like they have to perform the best. Put so much pressure on them. Focus on the effort. And I want to give you one amazing, my favorite example. All the philosophy I'm teaching is actually based on a uh, parent educator and psychologist who wrote the first democratic parenting book in the 60s. His <laughs> name was Dr. Rudolf Dreikors. Nobody even heard about democratic parenting. And he went to a school, he actually studied with Maria Montessori. This is all also like background Montessori positive discipline. He went to a school where the six year old had this horrible penmanship. And what do we usually do, you know, make them study harder, I can't believe, ah, oh, I'm writing and on, and the teachers and everybody tried to encourage them, fail. So Dr. Dreykos goes to the little boy and, and, and picks up his scribbles and looks at it and says like, oh, this is a fine looking O right there. He focuses on this one legible letter. Mm. From that moment on the child felt encouraged. When you want to encourage, if it's about homework or anything else, focusing on what they have already done well. You know, we, most of us were raised with a, for, I can't believe, look at this, and our parents thought that was encouragement. We don't, we don't want to blame anyone here. We just do what we know, right? And what was modeled to us. We all try and our best. Just you sitting here today told me already awesome parents. Because this room should be like, filled with like hundreds and hundreds. 
So give yourself a pat on the back. <laughs> you know what? And what happens? It's usually the good parents. <laughs> but even as the good parents, the great parents, there's so much we don't know. Wouldn't you agree? And that was a big eye opener for me. And I was like, Oh my God! I had no idea. That's why I thought, you know, I found my calling and wanted to know more. Who was going to ask the yeah. question? Yeah, based on the questions uh, uh, previously, if I want to be honest to myself mm -hmm. and to the child, right? like uh, she showed me a picture last year, she drew a turkey, but I thought that's a ladybug. <laughs> 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 and I, she said, how oh, do you think about it? I said, oh, what a beautiful ladybug. I said, mom, I drew a turkey. <laughs> and then she cried. <laughs> I don't know. That's so cute. Yeah, so. That's awesome. <laughs> the, the boundary, like, uh, between the greenhouse and, the, you know, I created, like, a, I don't want to create a greenhouse. Uh, she grew up, like, in a greenhouse, like, a, like, a. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how can I be true? What do you, to, I don't understand what you're achieving. I want to be true to myself, I'll be honest to her as well, mm -hmm. and give her some, not like a, to, to give a harsh comments on her artwork, mm -hmm. but how can I ma question. manage the boundary? Yeah. Good question. What's your name? Uh, my name is Pong. Pong. Yeah. Pong, uh, in that moment, okay, we had you had that experience where you pointed out this is, you know, Lady Barker or whatever, yeah. and it wasn't. And um, maybe you just remember it for next time. If you're not quite sure, maybe don't mention <laughs> it. <laughs> just, just maybe focus on something that you do like about the pictures, the colors, or the drawing in itself, or ask her. Oh, you can even say, you know, what did you draw? Uh, first. <laughs> <laughs> Treat her like my boss. No, I understand, and you know, we all do it. I've done this, you know, but it's, it's also okay. We make mistakes, it's okay. And then you say, oh, I'm sorry. You I'm know, sorry. Okay. like, and then continue with the internal motivation. <laughs> internal, internal motivation. Yes. Any suggestions on how to not repeat yourself instructions yes. over uh, and over? Yes. I think every, all of us can agree that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Too many times. I know. I know. Um, I can give you a couple examples, and we don't have the time to go too deep. But we have to understand the, the reason why we do this, again, we're conditioned to repeat ourselves because everybody does that, right? But usually what happens when we repeat ourselves, then we lose patience, right? Mm -hmm. Then we raise our voice and then usually we react at the end, right? Because we don't know what else to do in the moment. Again, that feeds into the power struggle. So we got to stop that pattern. However, we don't know how, right? And for example, um, let me give you a couple examples. I, I mentioned earlier if there's a mess, if the child makes a mess in the living room, not mm -hmm. that could be a good example, right? Uh, maybe give me a couple examples or I'll give you what, what happens. Like, put your shoes on, we're leaving yeah. now. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> that happens to You too? That happens to you? <laughs> That's actually a very, very simple solution. Yeah. <laughs> it's too easy. Um, there's, there's different ways. I go more into detail when we do the five week, but here's, you can make, for example, it often happens morning routines is, yeah. is a big problem. Evening routines, right? Where you find yourself constantly re repeating. We have to think about, okay, when you repeat yourself, the child is not listening. They're communicating my basic need for power and control is not met, okay? We need to understand that. So then we have to find some tools, and there's different ones. So sometimes we have to experiment, but if those tools, those comments don't work, we set a boundary with a consequence built in. What I hear a lot, a lot of parents, and I used to be guilty of that too, you keep talking and talking, and you maybe set boundaries, but there is no logical consequence. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a logical consequence, 
So nothing is going to happen. Logical consequences are the best teacher. And you don't have to do the talking. For example, with the shoes, i give you different examples. We could come up with a whole morning routine where we empower the child. That's what I do often when I visit people's homes or we talk on Zoom is, but we include the child and have them be part of the solution. So we go through like a chart, said, okay, what time are you asking them? Because we usually tell children constantly what to do, right? Mm -hmm. Did you know the kids get over 2,000 compliance requests daily? Mm -hmm. They don't want to listen to their parent anymore. Mm -hmm. They're already like, they want power, they want their basic needs, they come home, but they know they feel safe and they can test you, right? They can't get away in school with it, they end up in the principal's office. So <laughs> you can do a chart with them with the whole morning routine, include them, make agreements. Uh, for example, you know, the shoes are the last thing, um, put your shoes on and then maybe I'll give you a little quality time afterwards or then you have time to play so you can put like the task before the fun. Um, the other one is, if they still don't want to put on their shoes, I suggest to parents, I said, okay, before, like five minutes before you have to leave, you can do different things. I said, do you want to put on your shoes now or in two minutes? Give them a choice instead of just saying, put your shoes on. We, they don't want to hear that. It's a command. It takes power away from them, right? Do this, do this, do this, do this. <clears throat> Give them that choice. The other one is, um, if they're still resisting, that could happen. Only I'm going to give you the tools right away that still may test. So here's, I'm going to give you like a consequence. I said, do you want to put your shoes on here or do you want to put them on in school? I mean, what's the worst thing that could happen, right? Mm -hmm. Just throw and follow through with it. If they don't put the shoes on, say, God, we're going to leave, pick up the shoes, throw them in the car. Let them put... But you see, you don't have to repeat yourself to do that. We need to stop repeating. We need to stop engaging because that only feeds into the power struggles. Take action. So throwing the, the shoes in the car or let them put the shoes on. Maybe they don't like it. You know, in front of them, oh, my shoes are not on. All the kids look at them and say, why are your shoes are not so these could be some of the examples you can follow through. So the consequence is to put the shoes on in the car. Mm -hmm. right. In the car or in the school. Okay. But you don't have to repeat, but they still have their shoes, right? <laughs> if they still don't want to put on their shoes, I mean, it's worse, you just hand them to the teacher and said, here, you know, let them experience the consequences. <laughs> <laughs> the same is with, the same is with clothes. <laughs> Teachers take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never do it again. <laughs> so let's, let's keep this shoe thing going. Um, <laughs> I think it was the book uh, Honey Gather Parent um, that basically made the claim that uh, for thousands of years we did everything collectively, right? Like, and now in the West we're all about autonomy. Kids, you're two years old, put your shoes on by yourself. You know, you do this, eat your food by yourself. Whereas, you know, Everyone did everything together collectively for thousands of years. Now in the last 50 years, we're just autonomy, 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 right? So in this scenario, let's say your kid is not like 10 years old, right? Your kid is five years old. Mm -hmm. If you put your shoes on your kid, are you teaching him the right thing? Is that okay? Like, I, I, what are I your thoughts? I probably wouldn't. However, you can, you know, also we have to, Keep in mind, it could be also an attention seeking. Sometimes we don't know, okay? Again, you have to ask yourself in the morning, are those basic needs are met? That's always the first question. And how is my relationship with this child? If there's a lot of nagging going on, criticism, nobody wants to listen to you, right? So we need to encourage them first. But if, it, them. if it's about phrasing, if it's saying, oh, I understand you're having a hard time mm -hmm. with this today. I was just getting into that. Um, so yeah. let's work on this together. Like, is that phrasing? Perfect. Fun? Okay. That's that's great. Okay. And do you know, like, when you ask this question, I assume you had something like this happening to you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so what I, what I'm trying to ask: Had that child ever put their shoes on by themselves at all? Here we go. That's that's already the answer. If you know they can do it. 
say like go down on their level and say like you know I understand you would like for me but I want you to learn this yourself I have faith in you I know you can do this walk away let them figure it out and again if they're not quite ready just pick them up and just keep trying this again and later if you feel like they, they still need some help ask them and say would you like me to help you maybe do a little part of it not the whole okay you're welcome. Anybody else? Yes. So, same thing like you said, you, if you use an expression, I believe you cannot do the, like doing math or exam or homework, mm -hmm. how do you say it uh, in a positive way? If you're not, if they're not meeting your expectations mm -hmm. for that, <laughs> for doing a, a problem or <coughs> how do you say it in a positive way, so you're not repeating yourself. Um, let me think for a moment. That's just, just different ideas, it's a little more complex, but the easiest one probably would be, well first you're gonna sit down, let's say, if they have difficulties, ask them, you know, validate first, and then ask them if there's anything what they could do first, so put the problem onto them, what could you do to improve your math, but if there's no answer, I said, do you need my help, or do you need a tutor, and, and then, if they're still resisting, because homework is a big thing about resisting, too. They don't want to do the homework. You have to sit down with them and make an agreement with them. Really be, that's where the peaceful, in, in, in those seminars, we're spending like a couple hours just how to do peaceful conflict resolution, make agreements, and then once you have an agreement, we come up with a logical consequence. So there's a consequence built in, there's no, there's no choice about doing or not doing the homework. I said, okay, but I involve the child in the decision making. It could be as simple, I remember, it's a different learning styles is also a basic need. I had this one family I was working with, the child always wanted to work in her room, sitting on their bed, on their computer, and the father, no, you have to go, I have this beautiful office I need you to go into. But she learned better in her room with the computer, so as long as you're getting good grades, it's, you know, let them, give them the power, okay? And if they need additional help, explore with the child, ask, but ask them first, what would help you? And remember, if you do sit down with them, focus on the positive, like remember always dry course, remember the, the O, focus on what they do well first. You know, I see you got this right, you know, you, you know, it looks like you're putting so much effort into this. What else can we do? And just motivate them this way, but put it on them. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. We have until what time do we have? Like five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay. Maybe one more question before we wrap this up? Okay, wonderful. I like this. No question. You know Perfect parents now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but Rohini, I was just, I mean, for homework, don't get in a battle with your kids about homework. Let the teachers deal with it the next day. <laughs> <laughs> you say, it's like, fine, if you don't want to do your homework, go talk to your teacher tomorrow. If you didn't understand this, go talk to them. And then they're like, oh, no, 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 I want to get done. Well, that's there we go. Your, then it's their choice. But it's like, it, there's no point in parents arguing with your kids about homework because it does nobody any good. And if they don't do it one day, it's not the end of the world. The teacher will deal with them in the morning and say, okay, what was wrong? What was your problem? What was your question? And then they can deal with it. So do Thank not you for get bringing it up. <laughs> yeah. It's not worth it. <laughs> Unless it's on an everyday basis, then that's a problem. But if it's here and everything is here and there, one-off, it's like it's not that big a deal. They're going to survive, and then just put it all down. Natural consequences, you don't do your homework, you talk to your teacher. And it's their responsibility, it's not yours. Mm -hmm. It's not your responsibility to them. Thank you for bringing that up. And uh, that actually works really well. And uh, explain sometimes to parents to let the school or the teacher take you know, charge of that. So you just relieve yourself of that stress. Because there is a consequence in school. Right? You don't have to add anything. That's a good point. I'm also having on, on another note, I know you wanted to come up with some different workshop. That might be a good one maybe, just to talk about that, how to make agreements, how to come up with logical mm -hmm. consequences, make a plan, just something maybe to think about. 
I would be happy. I'm, I'm like, it's my expertise, power for <laughs> I did yeah. have one more question. Um, so a lot of times, um, I end up, my punishment for Devin when he's not doing something that he's supposed to be doing is taking away technology. He only gets technology during the weekends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's really precious on those Saturday mornings, <laughs> 6.30. <laughs> like, he knows that's mm -hmm. when, the, when he gets a few hours to do what he wants because he hasn't mm -hmm. done it all week. And so that's what I end up taking from him when something's gone awry during the week. And I mm -hmm. feel horrible doing it because I know how much it means to him. Is that a bad thing? <laughs> it depends how it's done. What I see, you know, I know the screen time can be a great motivation to get things done. Okay. Um, however, I want to make sure it's not too much screen time and we limit this as well. That could cause a fight too. But yeah. We can talk about this another time. So. There's nothing wrong if you maybe word it the right way. So you can maybe let them earn the time, but get certain things done, but make it look like it's related, okay? If the homework is, or they need to study something first, let them do the task first. And then when you, when you do this, what they need to be doing, if it's chores or tasks, then you, send, then you can have screen time, okay? So put an order to the day, that's one of the things we don't want to use it too much. I see a lot of parents because they don't know about logical consequences. So that's something you can learn more about. But we unfortunately don't have the time to get into this tonight. And I would love to maybe talk about it or you can call me or whatever it is. But for right now, I maybe would use it as you do this. If this is done, then you can have that. But they have to prove that first. Okay. So then you put the responsibility onto them. You say, it's your choice. Mm -hmm. You do this, and then you can have this. I want you to have your screen time, but here's what I need you to do. Okay. It's earning it, not just earning. giving it to them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. So I know I could go on and on and on and on. And uh, knowing now that there's so many healthy ways to raise your children, I hope you learned a few good tools today and I'll make you think about it and apply those. And remember, we influence a child's personality now into adulthood. Mm -hmm. We have to start now. And if you need any additional help, don't hesitate to contact me. Or if you want to sign up, I have those four week online classes coming up. And actually, if you sign up today or within the next 24 hours, if you need to check your schedule, I'll give you a $50 discount. So let me know. Speak to me at, at the end of this uh, presentation. And uh, I, I really, you know, my goal is just, I will, and spread the message. Tell other people about it. I always see, like, unless you would have come to this workshop today, you didn't know, right? There's so many wonderful tools out there. Let other parents know about it. We are all in this together, right? We say, like, peace begins at home. And um, so, yeah, spread the message. And I would greatly appreciate I hope everybody signed in. If you like to be on my email list, I frequently write articles, invite you to other events, and feel free to pass it on to anyone who might be benefiting from this. And uh, I know it takes a village to fulfill my dream to make a difference in the world. So I could use all the help I can get. And um, wanted to thank you all. Thanks for all you do to make the world a better place. <laughs> thank you so much. It was such a pleasure being here this morning. Thank you, Marcy, for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.